Um, and thank you very much for the invitation to speak tonight. I'm really excited to join the team, team here at Admiral. Um, this meme is quite representative, actually, of the lamest case like this I'm used to dealing with. And I'm not suggesting uh, the horse is actually fake lameness, but um, it certainly can be a challenge to figure out what, um, what level of lameness and what conditions affect athletic performance, because it does seem to vary between, um, between horses. So that's one of the challenges of lameness diagnosis that I particularly like. In a mature horse, um, injury is due to repeated loading, and that's the result of the job that we ask them to do. And the discipline uh, that the horse performs determines to some extent what the site of injury is going to be. And so we can use that knowledge to keep a close eye on these horses through their training and monitor them for, for injury and hopefully um, mitigate the, the risk of serious injury occurring. But today we're here to talk about falls and of course uh, no lameness is really acceptable in a fall. By far and away the main cause of lameness is going to be of an infectious origin, um, just with a small proportion of traumatic or accidental injuries. And because the lameness in these cases is often um, very rapid in onset and it can be quite severe, it's really easy to make the mistake of um, assuming that a trauma has actually occurred, such as the mare stepping on the foal. But um, that's actually, a, as I said, a small proportion of, of cases. And so we need to be aware that infectious um, disease is, is the prime candidate and looking out for that. Um, and as my nephew down here likes to do, um, he is going to meet many bugs playing in the dirt. And of course, foals are no exception. They're going to meet bugs in their day-to-day -day life. And uh, whilst they're immunologically immature, that presents a hazard to them. Um, and it's really the, the density of the bugs or the, the number of bugs, or if they meet some particularly nasty type of bug, um, that they're at risk of, of picking up um, an infectious process in the bloodstream. So with that in mind, we can think of some fairly obvious uh, management things that may reduce the risk of, of causing uh, lameness relating to infection. So overcrowding or poor ventilation um, are going to be a risk factor, such as, um, sorry, as is uh, having any um, umbilical problem with the fall that can ask, uh, act as a portal for infection or a zonitis of infection. The high risk mares, um, which Alex has already uh, spoken about, um, if we have a history of placentitis, then we know that those foals are going to be born with uh, the potential for circulating bugs. So the main routes of infection are through the lungs, through the gut, and as I said, also through the umbilicus. And the diagram just here on the left, you can see that the marker um, shows a simplified joint and the bugs that enter through these portals can circulate in the bloodstream and like to localize in um, the bones of the joint or the joint itself, or even sometimes in the muscle. So um, <clears throat> the key to this is maximizing immunity. And I won't speak too much in detail about this because Alex has already done a really good job of that just now, but um, making sure that the mare's colostrum is of good quality. And importantly, that the colostrum is, um, uh, that the mare has been exposed to the environment that the uh, foal is going to be born into for sufficient time that the colostrum contains the antibodies that are appropriate for that environment. So that's really you know, a minimum of two weeks, but preferably four weeks um, in that environment to make sure that it's going to be an appropriate immune um, response. Of course, your routine vaccinations um, are going to play a role as well. And any foal with a history of fatal passive transfer is not only at greater risk of developing a septic joint, but those foals uh, don't do as well um, when they're treated for that septic joint. So um, ensuring adequate colostrum, checking IgGs um, is really a key, uh, key management factor that we need to be focusing on, as I'm sure you all do. Now, just check my video works. Um, the age of the foal can influence when, uh, when and where the infection crops up. Neonates, um, so certainly the first week of life, tend to infect the joint and the synovial cavity itself um, with a small, smaller proportion developing bone infection. 
Whereas older forms tend to localize in the growth plate and they may or may not have a concurrent septic joint. The presentation, uh, oh, sorry, just need to go back there. The presentation of these folds includes uh, one or more of lameness, joint swelling, um, or swelling local to a joint. So I'm just trying to get my video does work. Um, so this fold, uh, you see it has a mild left fall lameness, got head lift, no, no, no. Um, this is not a great video for the hind limb, but I think you can agree looking at it now that there's not an overt um, hind lameness, but we can see as he walks past that huge um, effused hock joint here, we can even see it bulging out the front. So um, in spite of the low level of lameness, we need to have a high index of suspicion that that could be a septic process beginning to start, and we need to be um, right on to checking that. In, that, um, in the hind legs, um, tends to be hocks and stifles, in my experience, and fetlocks are also quite a common location, um, but really any location, and including those that are in tricky areas to palpate, such as the pelvis and the spine, can be affected. <clears throat> Typically, we're going to have evidence of systemic infection as well, so that may be um, fever or evidence on your blood work. Um, excuse me. So these folds need um, a very thorough workup, given that we've potentially got systemic infection as well. Um, we certainly a joint sample needs to be taken, and this is an extreme example here um, in the top. But you can see this is essentially pus that's come out of the joint, normal joint fluid. I'm sure many of you have seen, you should be able to see through it. <clears throat> Part of my assessment that I think is really important is to ultrasound the joint. And we're looking at the quality of the synovial fluid. So at the top here, the black is the synovial fluid. Um, and it's more uh, speckled than it should be, which indicates that it's got um, some cellularity in there, which is the normal response to infection. But it's relatively clear um, as compared with this, but down the bottom, this I'm outlining here, the, the contours of this joint pouch, and we can see all this gray material throughout the joint. And this is the products of inflammation um, called fibrin, and the bugs like to hang out in that. This is a more advanced, um, more established infection in, on this ultrasound here. And the relevance of that is that when we're determining our uh, treatment options, um, the, the, there are uh, methods that are more suited to one or other scenario. So it's really important information to gather. Uh, in addition to this, we're going to take some radiographs and these are actually of that little Arab fold that we just saw um, walking up and down, trotting up and down. And this just demonstrates the utility of uh, different imaging techniques. Now, if we look at the top panel here, these are all radiographs, just slightly different angles of that left leg. And I think you can appreciate there's a little bit of lucency up here, here, particularly on this far right one, it's a little bit more uh, obvious. And this is infection within this main bone, the tibia, and extending likely to the growth plate, although it's not that easy to identify um, within the growth plate. When we look at this Im these images at the bottom here, this is a CT, so this is a three-dimensional um, image, uh, imaging modality, and we're able to just slice through um, the joint at different locations, so it gives us much more uh, detail. And this can be really useful in surgical planning if you have this option. Um, here is the affected left hand, and this is the normal right hand for comparison. And we can see this huge um, defect in the bone, which is correlates with this on the radiograph, and it extends right through the growth plate and actually down into the joint. So this is why this fold has a concurrent septic joint. Um, <clears throat> and a colleague and I actually looked at uh, diagnostic utility of radiograph CT and ultrasound um, some years ago. And of course, CT is um, the most sensitive for picking up bone lesions, but ultrasound actually was extremely useful and more so than radiographs for identifying early onset of bone infection.
Okay, so treatment principles. Um, predominantly, we want to reduce the infective load in the joint and in the foal itself. Um, in terms of the synovial cavity, we go about that by uh, lavaging out that joint compartment. And this is why I said that the uh, this is why I said the ultrasound is really important because we can see that this uh, large amount of material within here may be actually quite challenging to remove um, and may need a, a physical, uh, a manual method to do that. For example, an invasive surgery, and I'll show you some pictures of that shortly. Um, it's really important to remove this tissue because this is where the bugs like to hang out. Um, so if, if you're not able to do that effectively, then you can really struggle to get on top of these infections. We may need to debride bone if it's involved, although that's um, done on a case by case basis, because certainly not all of them need it. Antibiotics, of course, are going to be adjusted according to culture and sensitivity results in the lab. Um, but before that information is known, we're going to start off with the broad spectrum um, approach. So here in the top left, um, this is to demonstrate the different methods for synovial lavage. This is an adult horse, but um, it just demonstrates the point. Uh, the, a needle lavage, which just entails needles being put in all of the various joint pouches. And this horse is under anesthesia, but falls you can do sedated very often. Um, and you can see it's a relatively non-invasive method of flushing the joint, and it can be very effective. Um, and really all that's required in those cases that don't have um, that thick material evident on ultrasound. But you can imagine that that material may not come out through these needles very well because they're obviously of a finite um, diameter. This is the alternate, um, it's somewhat of a long video, so we won't watch all of it, but this is actually an adult joint um, that we're looking in with the arthroscope. This is the end of the cannon bone here, normal white um, cartilage visible. And then over on this side of the congyle, we've got all of this horrible um, yellow um, and inflamed looking material. Some of this is uh, uh, fibrin, which is product of inflammation. This is actually, um, in this adult horse, this is actually post penetrating injury to the joint and it has a bone fragment here um, that's gonna need to come out as well. I'll just let this run for a little while. So you may not have seen, um, had the opportunity to see what goes on in, in surgery, but you can, um, you can see how this thick material here really needs a physical method of debridement. It's not gonna be flushed out very easily through a needle. just uh, using a motorized instrument here to free up this bone fragment. <clears throat> and in a moment, you actually see some, some hair that's penetrated the joint, which is not uncommon actually with traumatic injuries um, that, that penetrate the joint. Another reason to be able to look in there with the arthroscope so you can ensure that you get all of that debris in, um, material that might act as an ibis for infection out of the joint. I think we come up in a moment on the, oh, there we go. See, so there's a fairly large amount of hair sitting in there. So you can imagine that that needs to come out. But um, we are a bit behind time, so I'll just perhaps move on. If you want to watch that, then it'll be in, in the recording. <clears throat> so methods of antibiotic delivery. Obviously, we're going to use um, systemic antibiotics, um, but sometimes we need to try and increase the concentration of them at the site of infection itself within the joint. And we can do that using a few different techniques. This is an example of an intravenous regional perfusion. The foal is um, sedated lying on its side and we have a tourniquet, in this case above and below the joint that we're concerned about, which is the hock. And it's perhaps a little bit difficult to see, but we have a catheter here into the, the main vein that runs over there. And the um, vet is injecting a solution here of antibiotic. And what that does is to concentrate the levels um, to extremely high 
uh, concentrations in this area. And um, when we let that sit for a, long, a while and when we take these tourniquets off, off it goes um, into the body. But it's a really um, useful technique to try and get um, extremely high levels, which if you just injected into the Foles vein, um, you would have to use huge doses to achieve that same, um, same concentration in that, in that joint. You can also inject directly into the bone and that's quite useful when you have uh, bone lesions and I like to use the ultrasound to, to guide that so that I know I've got my injection in the site that it's needed. Or you can put, um, put it directly into the joint. Not forgetting the rest of the fall, as we said at the beginning, these infections come often from a systemic source and so we may need to address that specifically on its own. So things like umbilical resection, which this is an image here. Um, this is the folds, abdomen open, here's some gut. There's a horrible thickened umbilical vein. And this is it opened up on the right here and you can see the pus pouring out. So resecting that surgically can be really beneficial to reduce that um, potential for these bugs to keep seeding off through the foals bloodstream. Uh, for foals with pneumonia, you can also nebulize antibiotics to increase the concentration at that site. Uh, this is a foal that we saw last year actually, and it's a relatively uncommon manifestation of infection, but I thought it was a good example of how important it is to be aware of um, addressing all sites of infection. Um, the history was of a left hind limb lameness. It was relatively mild and it was somewhat int intermittent, um, but becoming more consistent in the few days prior to referral. The foal had a fever and evidence of inflammation on its blood work, and it had received um, a couple of different types of antibiotics over sort of the preceding seven to 10 days, and it really hadn't um, resolved anything. And we were able to find when we examined the foal abnormalities in the other legs. So we had um, some evidence of low grade sepsis in the, in the right knee. We had um, an osteomyelitis in the right hind fetlock and also in the stifle, but we couldn't find anything in this left hind limb, which was the, um, the main concern in terms of lameness. Uh, so we went ahead and CT this foal, and this is not the same foal, but just to demonstrate the technique. Um, they go on their back, if they're, provided they're under a certain size, they fit on this um, human, human bed and it's motorized and it drives through the CT ball, which is this circular machine here. And if you want to, you can stand, scan the entire foal um, in actually a relatively short period of time. So it's a very useful um, technique to use. <clears throat> and uh, this is what we found. So just to orientate you, this is we see the foal and this is a skeleton um, and here we have a lumbar vertebra so we're at uh, this sort of level just in front of the pelvis and we're cutting um, transversely uh, and the slices will head back um, sort of towards the tail end and stop at the about the level of the hips so I'll play that so we can see the pelvis coming in here that was the wings here are the hips and this is the abdominal cavity here with all of the organs in it. And just uh, freeze it here. What I want you to just focus in on is um, sort of shades of gray, but this musculature here, um, and if we compare it with the opposite side, you think you'll appreciate that the left side is quite a bit bigger. And we can see this dark area here within this um, left side. And th these are muscles. These are the um, <clears throat> paxial muscles that um, provide some hip flexion, but this is very abnormal. Uh, and this is actually an abscess um, in one of the muscles. Here's a, uh, an image that perhaps better demonstrates it. Um, and it's this muscle that we're talking about, this is the iliacus of the iliopsoas group, this one and this one together. And as, as I said, they're responsible for hip flexion. And, um, with the benefit of the CT, we were able to use our ultrasound and go to the foal and find that abscess um, on the foal ultrasonographically as well. And this is us um, flushing the abscess cavity. So we inserted a cannula in under ultrasound guidance 
um, and were able to aspirate a lot of pus and, and flush it out for a number of days, um, actually was required. But this fall actually did really quite well. But uh, this really demonstrated to me how, you know, we were getting nowhere until we did that test. And so, um, you know, always keep looking and keep revisiting, uh, you know, what your diagnosis is, because if they're not responding, it may be that we've missed something and we might need to just look uh, with, a, with a different type of in, imaging. So most importantly, how do these falls do? Well, there's a number of um, studies out there that have looked at this uh, over the years and there's a fair bit of variation, but it's, it's very difficult to compare um, one study with another. <clears throat> Overall, the survival actually is quite good. And there's these two papers out of SCOM, which are the lar lar largest scale um, studies that have been. Uh, the first one by Kirsten and Neil, um, which looked predominant, uh, solely at osteomyelitis. And then the second one, Thomas O'Brien, published only last year, um, a large number of, of falls with septic arthritis. And in this uh, latter study, there was comparison with the maternal siblings and the proportion of horses that raced or the proportion of foals that raced uh, was no different between those that uh, suffered with septic, septic arthritis and those that didn't. So, you know, that just demonstrates that it is worth pursuing, um, pursuing these foals. But a few important um, uh, prognostic indicators came out of that study and also have been found by others. Falls that were younger, so particularly less than a month old, falls that had multiple sites of infection, and falls with a history of failure of passive transfer all had a decreased chance of survival. So again, just underscoring the importance of um, that attention to, to cholesterol antibody in the early days. And that's the end of my talk. This is just a um, demonstration of the various different types of um, animals that I've investigated lamenesses on um, over the years. Uh, donkeys are not willing trotter operas, um, but luckily they only tend to get laminitis or arthritis, so they're quite easy to diagnose. Um, this is a young camel that um, I didn't go near until it was anaesthetized, but it was also very easy to diagnose. It had a fractured P1 um, that we were able to repair. And then this old tortoise, which my resident and I um, were very fortunate to get to scope the elbow on. It had some arthritis as well. I think, it, I think they lived to about 50, so not surprising. Um, I'd be uh, pleased to answer any questions if anyone has them. Yeah. 